You said a man is stuck in a tree. And he needs my help? Part of you would rather leave him there because he's a bit of a dick. But you're doing your civic duty. Okay, shit, show me. I've officially lost my damn mind. Piercing sunlight streams through the curtains, waking you. As you shift, you feel the two warm bodies lying beside you. The nude, nameless beauties continue sleeping the hazy night away. A night that you can barely recall through blurry memories of hard drinks, vicious fights, and fast driving. City air spills in through the open window like warm breath, carrying with it the vibrant city ambience. Traffic, arguments, laughter, loud music, shopkeepers making deals, the smell of potent smoke, horses, mild pollution, and street food beckon you to explore the chaos below, to take control, a challenge to survive even one more day in this man-made jungle. Rockstar Games is the undisputed master of sandbox RPGs, and we can bring this same open-world experience to our own roleplay games. If you want to run the most badass game of D&D, a realistic sim that'll make any player explode their pants but you're too intimidated to try it, or if you wrongfully assume that achieving a high level of simulation requires pages upon pages upon pages of preparation, then shut up and listen. Today we'll be diving into what makes Rockstar's sandboxes so goddamn tasty and delicious. Find out how on today's episode of Behind the Screen. Ah oh, shit. Here we go again. So let's just address the big thing right away. The size. Let's just remember that when it comes to building your Rockstar style sandbox, that Rockstar Games is a billion dollar corporation with thousands of artists at their employ, all working on the same game for five plus years, while you, my tasteful viewer, are likely just a singular GM, probably not a billionaire, and don't have years to spend world building. So it is incredibly important, vital even, to keep your sandbox to a manageable scale. A great sandbox could literally be a singular location, like a haunted mansion or a space station. It can be as expansive as an entire planet or multiple planets, even with multiple planes. But the size of your sandbox can quickly become a hindrance as we've seen in Starfield. Starfield is a game that allows you to explore thousands of planets, literally. But the entire gaming community, which never agrees about anything, can still unanimously agree that all of these planets are boring. Does the size of Starfield make it more immersive? Pues desafortunadamente no. And if only I was there to tell Bethesda what I'm gonna tell you now. But hey, you guys share this video around, you know, get word out. Maybe Todd will see this for the next Elder Scrolls game and take some of these lessons to heart. Then you'll have done your part. Because remember, only you can prevent dumpster fires. But my point is, bigger doesn't equate better. Take my word for it. Giggity giggity. This is especially true if you're a brand new GM or if you got brand new maiden players and you whip out some huge, gigantic monstrosity giggity. of a sandbox that'll only serve to intimidate and frighten your players. This is going to make the process of learning your tabletop RPG a slow, arduous, and even painful one. Giggity. Because nothing is more frustrating than having to stop mid sesh because you, GM, are suffering mechanical issues due to size. Giggity, 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 giggity. <laughs> but all jokes aside, the real issue with running a giant sandbox is that a simulation aims to offer as much player choice as is feasible, but that means that your sandbox will require many rules and systems. And if you aren't sharp on all of these rules, all these systems, then playing in your world is going to be a clunky and unwieldy experience. So if you decide to run a large sandbox, please stick to a system that you're already comfortable with if you can, something that you're already knowledgeable about. And if you're playing in that sandbox as a player, then you will have to come ready to learn some new rules. Okay, so we figured out the scale of our sandbox. But now how do we make this town, this country, this city, you know, feel like a real tangible lived in place? Well, that's really just a matter of the word got a little cut off there, but uh, I was trying to write immersion. <laughs> uh, what is it? I define immersion as that feeling of being mentally inserted into a world, into a place, into a scenario that isn't actually real, that isn't actually happening. It's your mind teleported into a whole new dimension. It's your imagination captivated. The more that a player feels that the world that they're experiencing could be a real place, then the more immersed they'll be. At the table, achieving immersion is a direct result of how closely the gameplay 
aligns with the core fantasy that you're presenting. Rockstar aces this, whether it's GTA, where you play uh, an aspiring crime boss, or L.A. Noir, where you play an ace detective on, the, on a big case. Every single system in their game, from bullet drop to dropping horse balls, aids the fantasy that they're presenting. But note that even though Rockstar's sandboxes are heavily grounded in realism, I would say that Breath of the Wild or Minecraft and even Animal Crossing present sandboxes that are just as compelling, despite being much more cartoonized and gamified. That's because immersion has nothing to do whatsoever with realism. Because immersion in of itself comes down to just two things, and that's your presentation and your gameplay. Your presentation is going to be literally everything that you put before the player, from the music that you use to the look of the very character sheet that you're using to the very tablecloth that you put down on your table for game night. It's the props you use. So imagine this. You're playing a Western. Now, to achieve total immersion, we might use a plaid tablecloth with some fake bullet holes in it, serve our players whiskey out of mason jars, play some Western music, print out these fancy wanted poster character sheets, and then maybe even give our players these spiffy bullet-themed dice. All of these various props will help transport your players' minds into that mental theater. If you're using a virtual tabletop now, I know you can't really use props, but you can definitely still make the most of player handouts, the music, and the sound effects. Rockstar excels at their presentation, especially when it comes to the menus in the game. Arthur Morgan has his own journal, as does Cole Phelps, and characters in GTA even have their own cell phones, which act as a game menu, in addition to functioning as literal cell phones relatively realistically. Now, our other component, of course, is the gameplay. Now, for me, gameplay, I think, is what we call the aggregate of all of the mechanics used in the game by the players to resolve their actions within that game. So immersion is achieved when your chosen mechanics align with your game's fantasy. People often mistake the point of a sandbox. I don't believe that a sandbox is a place to do anything. A sandbox is a place to do anything that pertains to the core fantasy. So GTA allows you to steal cars, you know, rob people, rob banks. It allows you to fly any vehicle, you know, drive any vehicle, shoot all kinds of guns, but you literally can't get a legitimate job in that game. You literally can't. Even with crime, it's not like you can just do any crime. You can't sell off and become a pirate. You can't go buy a PC and become a hacker. And you couldn't even stop being a criminal if you wanted to. There's no option to turn into a cop or be an informant. Being able to do all of those things would make the GTA sandbox more realistic, I guess. So why not give that to players? Because even though GTA is chock full of all kinds of mini games and missions and side quests and random events, none of that stuff that I just listed, you know, being a cop, being a pirate, none of that stuff aligns with the core fantasy that they're presenting, which is the fantasy of being a high profile but street level criminal. If we've added any of these other mechanics, then quickly the game turns into something else because it's going to be providing a completely different fantasy. It'll be providing a pirate fantasy or a hacker fantasy, and that is a different game. The reality, though, is that no core system is going to provide you all the rules that you need for everything in your sandbox. A true sandbox will require at least some homebrew on your part. So for your own sake, only bother building and developing mechanics that facilitate the core fantasy that you're going for. A grungy war-focused campaign should focus on in-depth armor and weapon mechanics, like maintaining your kit, repairing it, upgrading it. It should have interesting death mechanics. But let's say that you're running a horror campaign where weapons are pretty much useless against the monsters like Call of Cthulhu, then the last thing you're going to want to do is spend time homebrewing weapon upgrade mechanics. In that case, you might want to swap out any weapon mechanics for pure survival mechanics or sanity mechanics and maybe in that situation there aren't even death mechanics in your game because you just die when you reach zero hp now that's scary the systems that you present have to be well thought out because these are the systems that your players are going to be spending time with the mechanics are how the players interact with your world for each mechanic for each system that you choose to implement in your sandbox there should only be one question at the forefront of your mind and that's is this good for the player if you approach your games with this mentality then you are bound to create something that your players like as hopefully you will like this video if you've watched this long and please subscribe and if any of these tomes of knowledge have helped you in your past games then please join our other two supporters on patreon frankly 
each pledge means the world because it takes a lot of my own personal time and money to produce these free resources. And those that are literally volunteering their hard earned cash to help fund this channel, not only help all of you viewers by making sure that I can continue to make this content for you, but they're also putting their faith in us and me and endorsing what I do here, making it that much more possible for me to be able to do this for you guys full time. So for our first and only two patrons, big ups, word to your mother. And now for something completely different. <laughs> and so to minimize the amount of waste that we can accrue while we're building, while we're homebrewing, while we're, you know, preparing our world, I like to follow these five steps, which I call the GTA 5, because these are the five principles that I've personally learned from the design of Grand Theft Auto that I try to apply to my own sandboxes whenever I go to build my worlds. So here's the first step. One. Define your fantasy. Is this heroic fantasy? Is it grimdark? Are we cowboys? Are we space explorers? Are we aliens? Are we detectives? Are we bounty hunters? This is going to determine which game that we choose to run our sandbox in. Number two, choose your genre. Is this going to be a mystery, a horror, an action, an adventure, you know, uh, exploration type game? Is this sci-fi? Is this comedy? Is it a spoof, sort of like GTA? This will inform the mood and the tone of your sandbox and will help us choose the right mechanics to reinforce that mood and that tone that we're going for. Number three, choose a core system that is already going to work for the fantasy that we're trying to portray and the genre of game that we want to run. If you're doing a Serenity style space comedy sandbox, then it would do well, do you well to do it in Traveler or Starfinder, not in Dungeon Crawl Classics. Know what I mean? Furthermore, try to pick a system that you're already comfortable with because then you don't have to try to learn the game at the same time that you're building your game. Because if you do that, you're gonna basically guarantee that you fuck up something with the world balancing or the world building. And keeping balance in mind, I guess, is something that is important for new GMs. But sidebar, I am starting to think that for me at this point in my GM career, that game balance almost feels like a myth of sorts. Folks tell me that my game games feel balanced but I don't actually believe in game balance as such like I don't think that the game should scale with the strength of the players I believe the deadly encounters should be able to happen anywhere at any time at any place at any level of play as well as easy encounters they should also work that way so my players definitely experience my style but they're still telling me that my games feel balanced you've achieved perfect balance balance you, you say words that have no meaning what is balance huh Huh? So I don't know. How do you guys define game balance? Is that something that's even important to your tables? And how has game balance or game imbalance, however you choose to define that, affected your tables? I, I'm just really curious. Let me know all of your opinions down in the comments below. Uh, but to my original point, Rockstar builds every single game in their Rage engine. And this reliance on that same engine choosing that same system has allowed them to leverage their previous experience when molding new games. So that way they're not having to learn, you know, the next version of Unreal at the same time as building their new GTA. This is gonna save a lot of time and cut down on a ton of mistakes because the Rage engine, the one that they're using, already has all the tools that they need to craft their high fidelity sandboxes. So again, choose the right system for your sandbox. For high fantasy, you'll probably just want to run D&D or Pathfinder. But if you're doing a noir mystery, then perhaps Call of Cthulhu or Knight's Black Agents is a better choice. And if you're going for a modern setting with low magic or no magic, then in that case, the fate system will probably shine. Four, read. <laughs> Get acquainted with the core rules fully and then start choosing the rules that you're gonna apply. You need to pick, you know, which rules are we gonna keep raw? Which variant rules are we gonna apply? What rules do we wanna uh, exclude? What rules are we gonna replace all together with homebrew? And you wanna focus on the systems that are essential to the game. These are the things that are gonna likely come up every single session. That's gonna be like, you know, resting. How are we doing short rest? How are we doing long rest? Are there any rest? You know, what are the death mechanics? How many actions and how long are the, the combat rounds? And how is initiative rolled? You know, all of that stuff. You wanna get that under your belt because that's going to come into play literally the very first session and lastly 
I don't know if you all can see this last <laughs> this last one down here because my camera lady is not here today, but I wrote brew because that is the final step to then start homebrewing in any gaps that are left in our system. And a lot of the times you don't even have to homebrew because most games are going to be a derivative of a core system. Like you'll have a game that's built on the D20 system or the Fate system or Gumshoe or whatever, right? So if you know of another game that's already using a badass mechanic that you wanna take for your game and it's using the same system, then very likely you can literally lift that system, those game mechanics wholesale. Maybe you tweak them a little bit and then plug them right into your sand box as is now this step is going to be ongoing because as you play through the campaign you will find that there are some rules probably that are inherent into the system that you're playing or rules that you implemented as homebrew to start to obstruct the core fantasy and some rules are just missing altogether like you'll find that your players or your party keep trying to do something that the rules just don't support it is in those instances and in those instances only where you need to start homebrewing this GTA 5 list is king. If you're making a low magic sandbox in a modern setting, then just choose a game that already takes place in the modern setting, like the Dresden Files RPG, and only add homebrew mechanics here and there as needed for your fantasy. This will take far less time than trying to homebrew hack modern day Chicago into 5th edition and then implementing all these weird restrictions to force 5e into being a low magic game. Which brings me to my disclaimer actually. Following the GTA 5 requires you to have knowledge of other games outside of D&D. But that's good. Even if you're a pure D&D simp, trying different games is a benefit because then you can see what those other games do well and then just steal them for your own games of D&D. So once we've done the GTA 5, we've picked our fantasy, chosen our genre, then we've taken our fantasy and our genre and used that to pick our core system or the game that we're gonna use. And then we've gone ahead and read those rules to choose and pick and define what we want specifically into our sandbox. And then we've homebrewed the rest of what we think is missing or what we need to tweak in order to get that perfect fantasy that we're going for. It is after we take these five steps that we can really move into building the sandbox itself. And that, my dear viewer, is a topic for the next video. Please like and subscribe if you made it to the end. Thank you so much for watching. I run an immersive D&D sandbox almost every day of the week. I run a steampunk style water deep. I also run a, a custom prehistoric campaign that has Conan style aesthetics and dinosaurs and that's in 5e. And I also run an incredibly detailed Night City in Cyberpunk Red. So come join me on Start Playing Games if you want to see the depth of what TTRPG can be. But that's really all that I have for you today, my lords and ladies. Stay safe, look after yourself and each other, and I'll see all of you in the next one.